today. As I mentioned, this is Food Systems Friday and it's organized by the Sustainable Food Systems faculty at Prescott College. My name is Robin Curry and I'm the director of the Master of Science in Sustainable Food Systems program. And we're an intentionally online program because we're seeking to support students in their efforts to build more sustainable food systems in their own communities. So COVID-19, has definitely put the spotlight on our food supply chains and has made um, more apparent, though those of us who uh, work in food systems know uh, knew all along that our existing food systems are not equitably ensuring food for all, uh, but the COVID-19 uh, crisis uh, put the spotlight on supply chains as many of us are disrupted in the crisis. So those of you who are less familiar, a food system encompasses all of the stages of keeping us nourished. So the growing, the harvesting, the packing, processing, the transforming, the marketing, consuming, and hopefully not too much disposing of food. And then it's all of those other elements that influence issues such as structural racism, political environments, and uh, policy frameworks. So um, as a faculty, uh, we started this uh, webinar series uh, because we ha had been thinking ourselves about the increased vulnerability to food security that's happened as a result of uh, COVID. And we know that people were already vulnerable to food insecurity and the health impacts associated with our political, social, agricultural, and healthcare structures. So we recognize food as a human right. And so we wanted to spend time uh, learning um, and providing opportunities for um, you know, the whole of the food systems community to learn more about the human right to food. <clears throat> so we invited um, uh, Baltimore Velasquez to join us today to help us learn more. Um, we'll speak more about his uh, career and uh, background in just a moment, but he is the president and founder of the Farm Labor Organizing Committee. Um, so welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today to speak about uh, addressing poverty and the designed systemic neglect of agricultural workers. Um, in two weeks on October 23rd, uh, we'll be airing at the same time and we welcome um, Gwen Garcelon uh, and another panelist soon to be announced. Um, and uh, Gwen Garcelon is the founder and director of the Roaring Food uh, Roaring Folk Fork Food Alliance. Try to say that five times fast. <laughs> um, and she's a professional organizer. Um, she'll be using the example of the Home Food Garden Project, which was a three-way partnership amongst um, nonprofit um, and extension organizations. Um, and she provides insights uh, into the logistics and the how-to of organizing, um, which makes wonderful sense to have as a follow follow up to our conversation with, um, with uh, Mr. Velasquez today. Uh, most of you are now Zoom professionals um, with all of the webinar time we've been doing, but just a couple details here. Um, the webinar is being recorded. Uh, we make the webinar available via our website for folks who are unable to attend. So thank you so much for affording us that opportunity. Um, but please know also that when you participate in the chat, um, Prescott College will be capturing that and we'll be distributing uh, the chat also. Um, and so uh, another thing to note during the webinar is that you are, you are muted and your camera is off, which may be very liberating for many of you, <laughs> uh, but uh, please feel free and, and we encourage you to interact with one another in the chat by introducing yourself um, and letting us know about the organizations that you're engaged with and care about. And um, if you feel comfortable sharing your contact information, that would be a wonderful thing uh, to do. So it's really a, a good community building space and I encourage you to take the time now to say hello and provide a brief introduction. Um, uh, let us know where you're coming from and please feel free to share some about uh, your work and the organization that you're engaged with. In that chat space, you're also welcome to uh, put questions that you have for Mr. Velasquez in there. And um, I will be monitoring it as well as uh, my colleague whom I'd like to introduce now, uh, Dr. Wendy Sue Harper. 
Uh, in addition to our faculty role in the uh, MS in Sustainable Food Systems program, where she teaches about soil composting and ecologically based practices for healthy soils and crops. Uh, Dr. Harper inspects uh, crop farms and processors for organic uh, certification. So we'll both be monitoring the chat. If you're having any technical issues, that's the place to let us know and we'll do our best to support you. So the theme of this webinar series is the human right uh, to food. And really what we are hoping to um, learn more about is what is it that we need to be doing uh, to transform food systems for the long term, the long term provision of healthy food for all as a human right. Uh, the United Nations recognizes and in aspects of international law that there is a human right to food um, it's not well um, uh, defined or implemented across all UN member countries, but just as a review, you know, the, um, the wording of the right to adequate food uh, is such that it's realized when every man, woman, and child alone in community with others have physical and economic access at all times to adequate food or means for its procurement. The right to adequate food shall therefore not be interpreted in a narrow or restrictive sense, which equates it with a minimum package of calories, proteins, or other specific nutrients. Now, the, the committee that put forth uh, the framing of the human right to adequate food also considered that the core content implies that the uh, food be available in a quantity and quality sufficient to satisfy the dietary needs of individuals, that it be free from adverse substances, which we know the majority of our food is not, um, and that it also be acceptable within a given culture. Uh, they also, the committee also considers that the, adequate, the right to adequate food implies that the accessibility of, the, that there is accessibility of such food in ways that are sustainable. And here's a very important part for today's conversation, that it's sustainable, but that it does not interfere with the enjoyment of other human rights. So thank you for taking time today to learn more about how uh, we ensure uh, the right to adequate food for all. Um, and uh, this is why uh, we've invited and we're so appreciative that Baldomir Velasquez has joined us today. As I mentioned before, he's president and founder of the Farm Labor Organizing Committee, also the chair of the Campaign for Migrant Worker Justice and co-chair of the Black Brown uh, Unity Coalition. He was a migrant farm worker as a child and young adult. He deeply understands the marginalization of agricultural workers and has insights into its historical persistence. Thank you, Baldemar, for helping us all to learn more about the drivers of this marginalization, but also the vision of the Farm Labor Organizing Committee to address the poverty and systemic neglect of agricultural workers. So thank you very much for joining us today. Appreciate it, thank you. Please feel free to start. Oh, okay, this is my cue. <laughs> this is your cue. <laughs> all right, um, uh, first of all, let me extend my greetings to uh, our West Coast uh, counterparts, the United Farm Workers, who have done so much to advance the um, the uh, the collective voice of agricultural workers in the U.S. Um, we wish that there was uh, 20 more United Farm Workers and flock organizations throughout the country uh, uh, to address the core issue uh, that I really want to get to uh, today. Um, uh, this access to food, uh, I understand very clearly. I remember starting to work uh, next to my parents you know, with my, alongside my siblings uh, uh, when we were five, six, seven years old. And the really what we had to look forward to of doing the field work uh, was the fact that we were gonna get some money to buy food. Uh, we didn't think about buying fancy clothes or toys or things like that. We're talking about getting food that's going to last us for the rest of the week until the, 
the next paycheck when we can go out and, you know, fill as many baskets of tomatoes or cucumbers or potatoes, uh, wagons of potatoes, uh, apples, cherries, strawberries, blueberries, raspberries uh, in the Midwest, uh, cotton in South Texas, uh, and uh, oranges, grapefruit in Florida. Um, it was always a race to have enough money to uh, have food. Uh, and if we were lucky, we uh, accumulated enough money during the summers uh, to buy uh, school clothes uh, uh, to go to school and maybe uh, uh, eventually get a pair of shoes uh, after yours got too tight. Um, and you wondered when you were working in those fields was, is this all there is to do in life? Uh, what's the what's the what's the future but i think that um this is not a, a situation that uh it's unlike what the other agricultural workers experience throughout the world and across the country uh, but if you look at some of the uh, conditions that were highlighted in 1960 i think when the uh when the um Edward R. Murrow filmed The Harvest of Shame. Uh, take a look at some of these conditions that we see right now in the Deep South, um, uh, the workers in the fields. Uh, I'm going to show some of those slides real quick. I mean, this is, this could be just about anywhere in the country. Now, this is tobacco, one of the main crops that runs through the Carolinas, uh, Virginia, Tennessee. Uh, those plants can grow over your head. Um, this is uh, a relatively uh, lower uh, plant, um, but uh, the, the, these those leaves uh, have nicotine on them, uh, and when it's moist in the morning uh, from the dew, uh, it, you know, they'll go through your through your clothes, and uh, you ingest the nicotine through your skin, and that causes uh, sometimes very severe uh, consequences of green tobacco sickness. Uh, they call it the green monster. Um, and, it, 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 and the people who uh, are impacted the worst and have the most violent um, uh, symptoms of the worst we ever had. Um, and um, uh, scared workers, uh, some of them can't, uh, are unable to do the work because of uh, uh, the uh, impact that it has on their bodies. Uh, uh, an investigator from Wake Forest uh, University uh, uh, calculated uh, by the ingestion of nicotine that um, uh, a worker who works daily uh, handling those leaves like that to put them under their arms in a trailer uh, is, is equivalent to smoking, uh, I think, over a, um, uh, two packs of cigarette a day. And um, uh, it's one of the many health conditions that we run into. Go ahead and switch the slides. Uh, some of these other work conditions. Um, um, if you can change the slide of the work conditions, please. Um, uh, go ahead, swing another one. They're packaging this uh, in the barns uh, to load them. Um, uh, this is a worker working barefooted, and uh, actually one of my staff asked me, well, why are these workers, go ahead and do the next one, why are these workers um, uh, working barefooted? And I explained to them uh, when we took this picture that um, they explained to us, well, we only had one pair of shoes, and we're not going to get them messed up working in the mud and working out in the field, because this is the only shoes that we have. So they ended up working barefoot in the fields. So what I'm saying is that there's a, a lot of sacrifice. Go ahead and change the slide. Um, the, that they go through. Uh, the, the this is the nicotine that gets off in your hands. Now your hands are skin is thicker than the, you know the under your underarms or your your chest cavity and so on. Um, but you ingest this, uh, the nicotine. That's the black tar uh, from handling the tobacco leaves. Go ahead and change the slide. Uh, and uh, this is just one uh, crop uh, 
it, that our, our members harvest. We're talking, um, we're talking the conditions in the fields, like see these leaves um, when they're moist from, uh, from dew or rain, the water has a nicotine and it go right through your clothes. And that's why in the morning, many of us, uh, I went to, did a six work week in a tobacco farm, moved into the labor camp and worked with a dozen workers uh, in, the, in, the, in the tobacco. And we wore, had to wear um, plastic ponchos uh, made out of garbage bags. We just put a, a hole for your head and uh, for your arms uh, to keep the water from soaking through your clothes and ingesting nicotine. And so, uh, when you're doing that in hot, humid weather, even at night in the morning, uh, your body is suffocating. So these are just some of the conditions. Go ahead and change the to the living conditions. In the what you come home to, uh, the sleeping quarters. Uh, this is not unlike the things I grew up in. Uh, they're dirty, uh, cramped, um, overcrowded. Uh, go ahead, the next one. Um, uh, can you hear me okay? Uh, these are some of the conditions that you see. Um, go ahead and change the connection, change the next one. So you see, you, you work so hard all day, and you come home to these conditions. Uh, it's very distressing. And then if you want to clean up, go into the cleaning facilities or the uh, bathrooms and showers. No, no, uh, the, the, the showers and the toilets. There's the bathrooms. It's, it's, it's these toilet seats, um, you see the they put them in a row, and there's no dividers. And we've had, uh, I've seen labor camps where there's many as uh, 10 uh, toilet seats right next to each other like that with no dividers. Uh, I can't tell how many labor camps we've seen with these conditions. And um, if you look at the showers as well, um, they're, they're not all that inviting. But if that's the only thing that you have to uh, wash off uh, the nicotine and the, uh, any possible pesticides, residues that are in your clothes, uh, you have to change clothes every night, every day, uh, and wash uh, regularly. Uh, and many labor camps don't even have uh, access to enough facilities uh, to be able to maintain the, uh, the, the cleaning uh, part of what you need to do to stay healthy. Go ahead and change the slide. And um, and I'm saying that there are agricultural workers that don't even have access to these facilities. Uh, we visited counterpart uh, tobacco workers in, in Malawi, Africa. And um, let me tell you, uh, they didn't have anything near close to uh, these conditions, uh, let alone showers uh, or bathrooms uh, like this. Uh, in the rural areas of uh, Malawi where we visited uh, our counterpart workers. When I say counterpart workers, these are workers who are harvesting tobacco for the same companies that we're harvesting tobacco for in North Carolina. And so uh, you go ahead and change the picture. Uh, and um, uh, this is very typical of the toilet facilities. Um, if there's another slide of them and uh, it shows them in a line um, uh, to the, um, uh, what they have access to. Uh, no, there was a, the other ones that um, uh, facilities. Which ones would you like us to show? No, no, no. You know, go forward uh, in terms of the, um, uh, the uh, yeah, there was going beyond the bathrooms, the, there, that's the ones I meant. And a lot of times when you have a crew that you got 70, 80 workers, um, 
and you live in houses like this, it reminds me of some of the labor camps I lived in. That's just a, a barn and that they converted into housing for the workers and it shows the kitchen facilities um, where you had to cook in. Um, and uh, there is um, um, a lot of times uh, like this is the kind of kitchen that the um, uh, the labor camp that I moved into, and there was like two stoves uh, for twelve workers, and we had to get up in the morning and compete for earner uh, to prepare our food uh, to go out to the field that day, and um, uh, so it's always like a rush. <clears throat> you do to get to a rhythm and a system so that everybody can uh, get your cooking in. Uh, you don't have much time to clean until later. Uh, and um, uh, we look at, at, a, at a time when we can change all of this. Um, we, we did it uh, in Ohio uh, in the 80s when we pioneered these uh, uh, supply chain agreements uh, with companies like the Campbell Soup, Heinz USA, Dean Foods, and Jane and Green Bay Foods. Um, uh, go to the action shots that we did it by organizing. Uh, we did it by uh, demanding that uh, uh, people at the top of their supply chain uh, inject themselves. We did it by organizing orders, uh, orders developing that collective voice, getting the uh, everybody so-called on the same page as to how to address uh, these egregious conditions. Uh, and we did it by putting pressure on the uh, people on the top of their supply chains. So um, uh, we marched, we picked, we demonstrated, uh, we did boycotts. We did what we had to do to get the attention of the people at the top of the supply chains. Um, and the conditions that, that we suffer, the marginalization, uh, have to do with one thing. Uh, I, I think we need, that's enough for the photographs for now. But I think that um, when you look at when you look at the uh, the margin the marginalization of agricultural workers, um, if you take the um, the idea that these workers, from the condition you just saw, uh, they're the hard back-breaking work they do in extreme heat and humidity. Uh, you're battling dehydration all the time. Uh, and um, frankly, you don't get rehydrated totally until you're back in the labor camp and drink more water. And um, when you think about the excruciating work that, that, that the farm workers do, and you ask yourself the question, uh, of the current public policy to uh, flood the response with uh, programs, uh, some good, some not so good, uh, like the food stamp program. Uh, we used to have during uh, Lyndon Johnson's war on poverty, uh, millions of dollars poured into uh, support uh, supporting farm workers for emergency housing, emergency this, emergency that. We pour billions of dollars into uh, responding to these uh, conditions of farm workers because they're in such poverty. So I, I sort of thought about this as in my early years of organizing and decided that that's not a subsidy to the farm workers, that's a subsidy to the agricultural industry. Because why should a worker who works so hard and that's such uh, back-breaking labor, why can he not, by the sweat of his brow, feed and educate and close his family? And the answer to that question is pretty simple. They don't get a fair day's pay for a fair day of work. And it's all, uh, it, and it's all on the hands of the people that design the buying of these uh, crops. So, most of the farms that we uh, organize uh, are suppliers to major corporations, uh, whether they're 
grocery store chains, where they're big uh, retailers uh, uh, like Walmart um, and uh, manufacturing uh, corporations like Reynolds America, Campbell Soup, Heinz USA, um, all the big um, uh, Whole Foods, all, the, all of the big buyers uh, that these farms supply they dictate a price to the farmer and most of the contracts that farmers sign uh, are signed before the crop is even planted and so the farmer's hands are tight and then if in order and the more you squeeze the farmer to lower their price like a, this is a, a typical thing that walmart does uh the farmer's got to figure out a way to squeeze out uh, a way to survive himself he got he's got the uh, thousands and thousands of dollars invested in getting a crop into the ground. And uh, he's got uh, a loan to the banks uh, and he's got, a, uh, he's got all that invested in the, in the crop. So he's got to get it out uh, in any way that he can. <clears throat> so uh, one of the things that happens automatically is the public policy advocates um, work to um, marginalize one group or the other. So that means you cut the workers' wages, uh, you figure out the shortcuts, and the workers are underpaid uh, in order for the farmer to survive. I'm not saying that's right. I'm saying that the, the farmer does it out of his uh, uh, desire to survive. So over the history of, um, uh, of this, um, uh, this issue, most of the public policy debate has uh, been left in the hands of sympathetic uh, NGOs, nonprofits, advocacy groups, certification, and auditing uh, organizations. You know, we can celebrate their successes, but they still fall short of uh, self determination. A democratic, independent uh, organization. Uh, and the ideal uh, collective bargaining. Because with collective bargaining, you create uh, what I call constructive tensions, where a worker has the right to negotiate what it's going to take to sustain his family. And small farmers uh, need the ability to figure out a way to negotiate and talk to the buyers of their crops a sustainable price uh, for their survival as well. Uh, so, so we argue that small family farmers themselves need unions, along with the farm workers. Um, they're subject uh, to crop pricing dictated to them by large corporations. <clears throat> I think we've reached the point uh, in the middle part of the U.S. It's a little bit unlike the West Coast. In the West Coast, you got a lot of corporate farming. In the Midwest, in the middle part of the U.S., you got a lot of small family farms that are suppliers to these major uh, buying entities. And um, we're, we get to the point now where we feel that in order to preserve agricultural farm worker jobs that are sustainable for a family, <clears throat> we need to first save the family farm. So uh, the, there's even an example of how these parties are pitted against each other. Uh, the current debates um, right now in the Department of Labor uh, Concerning agricultural workers, agricultural worker wages, and particularly the growing burgeoning uh, guest worker program throughout the country. I think last year we had over 240,000 uh, H2A workers that came into the U.S. Um, their uh, prevailing wage has been set by the Department of Labor uh, using uh, different wage surveys uh, by the Department of Agriculture. Uh, just recently, President Trump has, uh, has eliminated those wage surveys. That means that uh, possibly, <clears throat> unless there's carryover in the next year, uh, the, uh, the farm worker wages will fall back to the federal minimum wage or the state minimum wages in various parts of the country. Well, see, in this debate, you're going to have pushback from the advocates saying, no, we need these wage studies to get the workers' wages back up again. Uh, but see, you're really pitting the farmer against the farm worker, uh, and one of them is going to lose. If the farm workers win the higher wage rate, the farmers lose. 
if the farmers win, the lower wage rate, the farm workers lose. Uh, and both farm workers and, and small family farmers are under tremendous uh, competitive pressures, uh, not only because of this debate, uh, but because of um, uh, corporate growers and global corporations who are shifting crops to other countries. The agricultural export deficit with Mexico has, readily, has radically increased in the last decade, in large part the U.S. corporate farms moving their operations to Mexico. Um, now, this does not even include the global manufacturing systems that put U.S. farm workers at an unprecedented disadvantage uh, with the lower paid and exploited farm workers that are our counterparts in other parts of the world. Let me give an example of what we, we're seeing at, what this competition is. And we know this because we visited our counterpart in specific commodities like tobacco, uh, like wine grapes, uh, uh, like tomatoes and other crops uh, that, um, that we sell here in the United States that are imported uh, from uh, nations uh, that have workers that are, are immediate uh, competitors. So um, uh, in 2018, you were talking about the United Nations before this, uh, uh, this uh, started here. Um, the, there was a special rap, uh, rapporteur, Elio Elder, on the right to food of agricultural workers. And that agricultural workers comprise about one third of the world's workforce, 1.3 billion people. And there, many of them are working with a non contractual agreement. Uh, it was not any guarantee of fair wages, safe working conditions, and available remedies to any problems. And get this, 71% of all travel, child labor takes place in agriculture around the globe. Uh, these are our competitors here in the U.S. You know, I, I, as I said, I grew up as a child laborer, so uh, I know that uh, having worked with many families in agricultural, understand that the economic marginalization drives children to work to access food and shelter. Um, and um, and the, the fact that many developing uh, strategies uh, encourage uh, migration from one place to another, where we see this everywhere there's agricultural work. Uh, we definitely saw it in Malawi. Uh, they're using work schemes that were very familiar with us uh, right after the Civil War in the Deep South. When, uh, when, uh, when the slaves were emancipated, though the production system switched from a, a model that was equally oppressive for sharecropping systems uh, or tenant farmers, uh, and they developed this old company store routine where you never could get out of debt from the loans that the uh, that the owner gave you to put the crop in the deal, and uh, you never could get out of that. Um, so, um, and the the, the uh, United Nations Right to Food of Agricultural Workers report uh, also indicated that uh, that the supply chain uh, uh, production was an important source of jobs. Uh, it, it increased from 295 million in 1995 to 40, 453 million in 2013. Um, but they pointed out very clearly that uh, these jobs were often criticized for, ena for enabling slavery-like conditions. Uh, uh, corporations could avoid accountability for violation of workers' rights, um, uh, resulting the actions of their extraterritorial suppliers that are only contractually related to the corporations. Uh, this is uh, uh, the threat that we're suffering from uh, and uh, because the these global corporations only directly employ 6% of the agricultural workforce where the other 94% have these uh, 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 don't have very clear employment contracts and well-defined rights or protections. Uh, so in the U.S., this model is driven by uh, farm labor contractors. And we see this all the time. We're seeing it right now very heavily in North Carolina, where 
uh, farmers are now hiring independent uh, contractors uh, that the Department of Labor considers employers for the use of these H-2A gifts worker visas. Uh, they are, uh, in our view, the, what we've seen on the ground, uh, these workers are indentured workers to these farm labor contractors. They recruit them in their hometowns in Mexico or other places. And um, they, uh, they know their families and they come with a, it comes with a price, the ability to come work uh, here in the U.S. Uh, many times they're made to pay their own uh, fees at the American consulate for the visa for the inbound transportation, which according to law, precedent that we set back in uh, 2003 in, in a class action lawsuit uh, that, um, that these fees have to be reimbursed to these workers uh, in their first paycheck. Uh, these farm labor contractors violate that regularly and uh, there's no one to hold them accountable. Um, and it's very difficult to get a, a, a claim uh, unless um, uh, you're related to one of these H2A gifts workers and keep track of that worker the year round. Um, so, but the worst part of this report from this uh, special rapporteur is that the states many times have been complicit in uh, maintaining uh, this uh, exploitation. Um, for example, in 2007, Chiquita Brands International, a corporation based right down here in Cincinnati, Ohio, admitted to paying 1.7 million to Colombia's paramilitary group, United Self Defense Force of Guatemala, to kill uh, or um, intimidate uh, union uh, organizers uh, in the uh, banana sector. And um, uh, uh, and more recently, in a study from 2016, alleged that Ubikistan sponsored the use of forced labor on cotton plantations throughout its territory. Uh, this is a, a subject that I'm working on right now with the International Labor Rights Forum and uh, uh, International Union Federation. Uh, they're looking at the flock model of supply chain agreements to figure out a way if we can duplicate some of that uh, to bring uh, some kind of uh, sustainability to these uh, women who are being forced in labor. Apparently the government forces um, uh, families that are on some kind of assistance, uh, kind of like a work program uh, in order to maintain their, their uh, subsidies from the government. Uh, they force them to work in the cotton on behalf of uh, the athletic apparel that we enjoy, uh, that we buy at Walmarts. Uh, and uh, so we get cheap uh, in such brands like Nike. Um, and, but to their credit, uh, they are working with the, uh, the group I mentioned in order to see if we can find some way to ameliorate other uh, conditions in Uzbekistan. Uh, why is that important to flock? Uh, why is that important to us? Because uh, our, our members harvest uh, 30 some different crops in North Carolina alone. Uh, and um, we're talking everything from the tobacco to sweet potatoes, uh, to cucumbers, uh, wine grapes, uh, tomatoes, uh, strawberries, um, even Christmas trees right now as the holidays approach. Uh, and the reason uh, the uh, the, the international uh, organization like the World Bank uh, encouraged migration of agricultural workers from developing countries as a mode of development. I mean, this is completely ridiculous, but they do it because they understand the, uh, like Mexico, for instance, the second highest income for Mexico next to oil is the remittances that undocumented people and immigrants from Mexico and the U.S work and uh, send back to their families in Mexico. Um, so it's hardly a model to create sustainability for people to stay in their own countries uh, and find a way to, uh, to um, uh, be able to feed, educate, and close to other families by the sweat of their back. And um, so our, our response to this has been, uh, look, uh, why don't we uh, do something. 
we took the, the example of our what we did in the 80s with Campbell's soup. We said, we've had enough of this uh, playing against the farmers and the farmers against us. So we went after the Campbell's soup company. And after an eight-year strike, a seven-year boycott, uh, we got Campbell's to do what uh, everybody said they would never do. Uh, they sat down with flock. We uh, demanded that they brought all their farmers to the table that were suppliers and uh, actually uh, pushed them to form an association of those farmers that created a three-way tension in the room to negotiate prices. Uh, we negotiated prices that was fair to the farmer, that the farmer would have those prices, the ability to double our wages, to give us health insurance, and, uh, uh, and it came out of the extra money that the, the company put into the supply chain. This could not have been done uh, by some regulatory uh, process because there is no law that's going to require, even if there was a collective bargaining law like the United Farmers, Farm Workers have succeeded in getting California, the Agricultural Labor uh, 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 Act in, um, in California, uh, even if there was a, a national law like that, we would be limited to negotiating with the farmers. And we leave the manufacturers as scot free, who are actually set the prices in the supply chain. At that time, the farmers were being paid $34 a ton for tomatoes. And um, uh, after the first agreement, uh, we got the price up to well over $40 a ton, eventually up to over $70 a ton as the years went by. And so, uh, that w that allowed us to then uh, negotiate a, uh, a fair wages for the workers, uh, health programs, so we don't have to rely on food stamps and these uh, federally funded uh, 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 health uh, clinics that were, have been very good. Uh, the problem is they're only open once or twice a week, and you have to go on that night, stand in line for hours because you know all the workers would come to try to get their health care. Uh, needs met. So, um, so we took that model and duplicated it with Heinz USA, Dean Foods, and Jane Green Bay, and then the, uh, the the big agreement in North Carolina with the Manala Pickle Company. Why not duplicate this model on a global scale? Um, when we look at the um, uh, the workers uh, that we visited in our counterparts, um, here's what we did in 2016. Uh, with uh, our current part agricultural worker unions from Brazil, Malawi, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and Uganda. Um, we came together uh, for a three-day gathering in Malawi, and we crafted a international a consolidated call. Uh, this is directed, uh, directed to the tobacco companies to create a practical mechanism within their supply chains to institute freedom of association. This call was supported by the Global Congress of the International Youth Federation in Geneva in 2017. The model proposed uh, was the uh, supply chain agreements pioneered by Flock and the A's with Campbell Soup. Um, the objectives are to create the necessary structures for negotiations for workplace wages and conditions to enhance the sustainability uh, of families in their own countries to less migration and to create worker institutions that can influence public policy and governance and give agricultural workers the ability to fight corruption and misguided police and military activity. Um, this was embraced by the, uh, our counterpart uh, trade unions in uh, those various countries and uh, we're pushing uh, to make this happen. Here in the U.S., we hope to launch a small farmer farm worker alliance uh, this winter in order to put pressure on the uh, global companies that um, really, really design uh, farmers and farm workers uh, in a uh, subsistence uh, uh, place, and that needs to change. And it's not that these companies are hurting for money. Uh, when there's bailouts in Washington, they're the first ones in line with the handouts. Um, and so I think that this time for the American public to stand up and say, we gotta stop putting up with this and let's stop treating the symptoms. Uh, it's not wrong to 
feed the families, have the food drives, and, and do the things that we've done in this um, uh, pandemic. They were, uh, they were in the middle of, uh, it's not wrong to do those things, but we've got to go beyond that. Because if these uh, global corporations, uh, if we're able to uh, compel them to address the equities in the, the, the supply chains that they have designed, let me tell you, it's their design. If you talk to any of these corporations, I don't care whether it's a Walmart or a Reynolds Tobacco Company, uh, they have their quote, procurement departments. They got the procurement specialists. And this is what they do. They go out and find people to beat up each other to see who can work for the cheapest and get the cheapest prices. They can get the uh, consumer price as low as they can to compete with each other. Um, there has to be there has to be a measure of tension that has to be created. And you cannot create this tension by being an advocate. You have to organize the people who are subjected to these uh, uh, evil, uh, unequal designs uh, to organize and to have a collective voice. And this is very difficult, difficult work, and it takes a lot of sacrifice. It takes a lot of um, perseverance, uh, and, and many people don't have that. Uh, so when I talk about organizing and the kind of people that we need to do the organizing, uh, you have to be all in. Uh, I tell people when they come to work here, if you're going to ask me how much you're going to get paid, you're asking me the wrong questions. Uh, we, we, want to, we want to help and support the people who are doing this work, uh, but this is not something that somebody's handing you a blank check to do. Uh, you not only have to do the organizing, you have to find the resources to do the organizing. Uh, but the number one thing, you've got to find that organizer that got that fire in their gut and that got the, uh, uh, the decision in their heart that they're going to stop putting up with these abuses. And um, when you grew up in the conditions that I did, watching my parents get cheated, watching my parents get abused, watching my mom get cussed at, um, you get to a point where a young man is angry and decides, you know, I'm not going to put up with this anymore. And um, what I mean by not putting up with it anymore is that, that this is what you're going to do regardless of the consequences and regardless of what you have to sacrifice and push. And um, uh, so we're always looking for good organizers. We've had a lot of good ones. Um, and, um, but the support network is uh, invaluable. We couldn't have done that Campbell Soup campaign without the great supporters in the churches uh, throughout the country, uh, among the uh, people whose hearts uh, uh, for others. Uh, they could do what they could do. They, they, they may have been old and had uh, physical disabilities, uh, but they would come out and support our marches and demonstrations when they could and support us from afar. So I think that um, uh, there's a great need in this country right now to uh, start a thing uh, about uh, these uh, global uh, supply chains and how work is structured and who makes the decisions and organize the marginalized people to develop their own collective voice and not leave it to the hands of advocates and other advocacy groups to do the speaking for us. Uh, this is what I've done for 53 years now and um, uh, ain't gonna stop uh, because um, uh, it's like breathing. Uh, if you want to if you want the workers to really to come out of where they've been, uh, it's not going to happen by itself. Uh, you have to go out and encourage and mobilize and, and keep talking and winning support is over uh, to go after the top of the abusive supply chains that farm workers suffer from. I can't think of a single farm worker in this country that is not impacted by decisions that other people make uh, in the design of producing that commodity that he's picking with his hands. And uh, this is what we have to do. Um, well, I don't know, I think I've sort of run out of uh, uh, what I wanted to get out and uh, hopefully that would create some space for some, some lively questions and conversation. Yes, thank you very much. 
Um, so far, nobody has put any questions in, in the chat, but I put the invitation out right now to all of the, <clears throat> to all of you who've joined us today, uh, to please not, not be shy. Um, uh, Mr. Velasquez has, uh, committed his time to, to this issue and to all of us. So if you do have questions, please feel free to, um, to ask them now. And uh, while you're, you're thinking about them, I did have, um, as I mentioned to you uh, before, Baldemar, I did have some questions that folks who couldn't make it today um, live uh, put to me ahead of time. And one of them was uh, that folks were very intrigued uh, by uh, the, the title uh, that you put forward for uh, today's uh, discussion. And they were wanting to learn more about um, what what you meant and intended by um, by the uh, term designed systemic neglect, and really wanting to you know dig a little bit deeper there. So what what kind of neglect and where does the designed part come from? Well, the design is exactly what I was describing. Uh, uh, the uh, procurement that these corporations uh, design. Uh, you know, uh, back when we were doing the Campbell Soup uh, fight, um, it really comes down to the numbers. Um, we were getting paid 16 cents uh, a basket. That's a 33-pound basket of potatoes. Uh, so there's approximately, what, 60 baskets in a ton. Uh, so you know, that's the portion of um, you multiply 60 by 16 cents, and that's the part of the $34 a ton that the farmers had to pay out of, of what they got. But when you take into consideration the transplants, the fertilizer, the diesel, the depreciation on their tractors, and um, uh, yeah, uh, that they, what it cost them to put the, um, the crop in the ground and what they had to get out, uh, at that time, the break-even margin for a tomato grower, uh, he had to yield 16 point, I think it's something like 16.3 tons an acre to break even. The average yield per acre of a Campbell soup grower in 1986 and uh, three years before, the average yield was 18 tons an acre. So he's only profiting 1.7 tons an acre. And the average contract uh, acreage contract for a uh, Campbell's farmer in those years was about 40 acres. So you multiply 40 by maybe $50 and you come out with a $2,000 profit. Uh, you do the math. Now, based on $34 a ton, uh, what is it going to take to change that number so workers, uh, I think the minimum wage at that time was a uh, uh, $3.35 an hour. Um, we wanted to uh, radically increase that base. You know, we could make more incentive if we picked enough baskets of tomatoes. But uh, they have to guarantee that three thirty-five an hour. We got that uh, that minimum uh, minimum wage raised in our first contract to four eighty-five. So uh, that was a dramatic increase base uh, that we enjoyed that first year, but we had to move that $34 a ton to over $40 uh, when we took into consideration the buying of the uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield policy for all the tomato workers that had to come out of the pricing. So we had the, that's the deal we made with the Campbell Sioux Company. The money had to come from somewhere. Uh, the grower's not going to uh, be able to, uh, increase those prices with uh, uh, $34 a ton. So uh, the Campbell Soup people, you know, for years, uh, their, pro their procurement uh, system uh, argued that the market this and the market that, and uh, this is what the rate is, uh, $34 a ton is a fair price. Might have been a fair price for them, but not for the farmer and not for the farmer. So that's what we had the impact. We couldn't do that without getting Campbell Soup to the table. And um, many other benefits uh, came out of that uh, over the subsequent years. But that supply chain negotiations was very successful. We duplicated with the Heinz Tomato Company, Heinz USA, 
with the Dean Foods Corporation out of Chicago. It's a dairy uh, company, but they had a uh, cucumber uh, subsidiaries in Ohio and Jane and Green Bay Foods. Uh, and the labor intensive crop was cucumbers. So we did the same thing in the cucumbers. And uh, this is the reason this is that model is important because we dealt with such things as abuse of farm labor contractors, crew leaders, uh, uh, workers who were brought here in a, uh, uh, in a uh, indentured manner, uh, workers who were, uh, we, we got women out of uh, 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 very bad sexual harassment uh, conditions in some of those farms because workers had a collective voice and were able to clean these things up. Uh, I always like to argue that the child labor issue in this country ain't gonna be solved, not by setting some kind of standard in Washington, it's gonna be solved when the workers get organized and negotiate their children out of the fields. This is what we did in the cucumber industry. Again, it couldn't have been done unless we had the corporate buyers at, at that time with Elastic Pickle and Heinz USA and Dean Foods, we had those corporations at the table say we want to get, at that time, um, I think about 15% of the workforce were children under 12 years of age in the cucumbers. Wow. We got those kids out of the field, but we couldn't get them out of the field until we upped the wages for the parents so the kids wouldn't have to be in there uh, harvesting cucumbers in order to make ends meet. Uh, so we had to back radically increase the, the wages of the, of the cucumber workers. And it's not, it can't be done out of the farmer's pocket, who's our direct employer. We have to go to the top of the supply chain and get elastic pickle to change the prices. And then what we did in the collective bargain agreement, uh, we knew that we couldn't solve all the problems in one or two years. Like, for instance, what do we do with the kids when we get them out of the fields? Do, do, do we leave them to languish in those really dilapidated labor camps on their own? Uh, or we'd get them in the summer schools, uh, the compensatory education projects, the migrant Head Start programs. But the migrant Head Start program did not have capacity to take all the children out of the fields and into the schools uh, during a work day. Plus, uh, the parents uh, would find it difficult to leave the work site uh, in the fields at three o'clock to get their kids uh, uh, when they when school ends. So we did a a um, a, uh, an industry committee made up of the corporations, made up of the farmers uh, associations and the union, and went together and pleaded our case to the state government and to the federal government. We need, uh, we need to expand the capacity of those uh, uh, migrant Head Start programs. And we need the money to extend the hours from three to six o'clock uh, so that the parents don't have to come out of the field early. We, we did a year's turnaround time on that. In the meantime, we got one of the corporations, Heinz USA, to pay for the first year of the contract to rent uh, an elementary school to take the extra kids in in the Head Start program. So we upped the wages of the workers, got the kids out of the fields, into the schools, and then the next project was to uh, deal collectively with the smaller and those labor camps. We made a deal with the State Department of Development, and we had... Campbell's, Heinz, and Dean Foods with us, uh, and the grower, two growers associations, and of course the, the union. And we went to the development department of, uh, I think, Governor Celeste in, in, uh, in that year, and we argued that you need to put money into the housing uh, to renovate the squalor and the labor camps because the state that has the housing has the workforce. The state that has the workforce attracts the contracts to these major companies. Uh, for the farmers who supply them. Uh, that strategy went really well, uh, and um, we got the governor to put half a million dollars in his biennium budget. Uh, at that time, you could build a brand new labor camp well, with eliminating the common use facilities, the pictures that you saw uh, earlier uh, in those labor camps. And we, we developed a, a basic design. They were like duplexes, where families who have their own stuff contained showers, bedrooms, kitchens, on their own, and um, uh, it would it cost for a crew of forty workers about eighty five thousand dollars to build a labor camp like that. The the, the state program uh, you could grant twenty five thousand dollar grant to those work, to any farm who committed to doing that, and the companies in turn uh, 
any grower that made that jump on that, they would guarantee a contract for growing cucumbers for the next 10 years that allows the farmer to get the balance of that investment back right. over a course of a number of years. So a lot of these things can be solved if we get the entire supply chain uh, in some kind of uh, negotiating what I call extractive tension. Yeah. Thank you. I think that there was one question specifically about um, about that term, the constructive tension, uh, and what it what it entailed. And so uh, the specific question was, uh, you know, on how uh, you and uh, Flock had utilized uh, the constructive tensions in your organizing. And before you you answer that, I wonder if you could. Pull back just a little bit from your speaker. We're getting a little bit of feedback. Oh, so sorry. maybe we'll try it this way and see if that takes care of it. So Okay, sorry about yeah. that. So the question was about that concept of construction tension and how you uh, utilize it in your organization. You can't have constructive tensions unless all of the parties have a collective voice. Uh, you have to have um, uh, an ability to give and take. But if one side has all the power and can retaliate against you to limit your ability to speak up and speak honestly about your problem, about your need, uh, then it doesn't work. You have to, in order to have a constructive tensions, you have to create a collective voice and an ability, uh, a, a leverage of power, so to speak. And the only power that we have really is our bodies and our work. Uh, and of course, our ability our ability to articulate what our problems are to the to the to the public because I think that image is um, is very important to everybody definitely very important to these big manufacturers and retailers and these corporate entities uh, and I think over the years what I've seen in the farm labor movement whether it's the United Farm Workers Cesar Chavez uh, who I spent much time with uh, before he passed away uh, the the attention that the first campaigns got uh, with the with the consumers around the country uh, was um, a very critical element to give those farm workers in California uh, that ability to participate in tensions in a constructive way that they had a voice a collective voice and they needed to be listened to so it's not just listening to the farm worker himself listening to who he brings with him and who's backing that person. If, and consumers can play an enormous role in helping us do that. It's like our campaign with the uh, Reynolds Tobacco Company. Uh, yeah, we're, we're picketing 7-Eleven and uh, Circle K stores that are the big sellers of the uh, Views uh, e-cigarette product. It's the, supposedly is the product of the future. And um, so uh, we, we, we take on the, that public image and the, um, uh, the retailer, uh, 7-Eleven or, or Circle K, they're not going to like that negative attention. So they, even in turn, will put pressure on, on Reynolds Tobacco or speak to them at least. We don't like these people handing out flyers in front of our stores. And so um, it's gotten their attention. We are talking to Reynolds Tobacco right now. Uh, and like I said, that um, uh, you got once you have some constructive tensions you're, when you're dialoguing, um, uh, just make sure that I tell people not to personalize th this thing, not to personalize any struggle, uh, that uh, it's, a, it's a scriptural principle of uh, hating the sin and loving the sinner, um, that you hold his feet to the fire, though, uh, for his own sake. Because when you oppress other people and you have a system that you've designed that marginalizes people, that keeps people in poverty, it keeps uh, children uh, um, from being stunted in their growth, their ability to get an education, and who knows, negate the possible next famous teacher, lawyer, uh, uh, educator, doctor. Uh, maybe it's the doctor who's going to have a cure for uh, COVID or some other uh, disease. Um, and uh, you limit that, uh, that person, that child in, in agriculture uh, to a life of peonage, uh, you know, you're, you're doing yourself uh, as a human being uh, a disfavor. And um, uh, frankly, 
if they know, if they pointed out they're doing that, I don't know how they can sleep with themselves at night when you know you're governing a system that does that to other human beings. And we have to call them out, not demeaning them as individuals, but saying, look, you know, you got to call this to your attention. And frankly, many of the corporate people that I've negotiated with had no idea what was going on at the bottom of their supply chain. Uh, but once they knew, uh, it created, I've always learned that uh, in all of the campaigns we've done, that somebody in that corporation listened. And, and, and even though there was a disagreement internally with them, there was always someone in that corporation that was saying, you know what, these people may be right. We might, we might have to do something about this. So. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a, it's a good transition to another question that uh, came from, uh, this is from Erica. So she is the, uh, or they are the new chair of the Florida Food Policy Council. And they're wondering what can they do to assist. Um, so the, the direct question is, what can I do to assist our farm workers and other workers to gain equity, diversity, and inclusion? You're, you know, there's been a lot of good programs throughout the country to uh, train farm workers for other occupations, get them out of that um, lifestyle. But for every person you take out, some other guy comes in and takes their place. So you still have to deal with the inequities in the, in the uh, work and uh, whatever crop that the, the farm workers are working in. And frankly, in 53 years, and I've seen, you know, starting with the Lyndon Johnson's War on Poverty, like I said earlier, all the millions of the billions of dollars that we put into uh, addressing the symptoms of these inequities, uh, it hasn't changed the systemic uh, designed uh, exploitation. And in order to do that, you have to find farmers who want to organize themselves. The, the, you have to find the farm worker who says, I've had enough of this, I'm not putting up with this anymore, not for me or not for any one of my coworkers, or anyone coming after us and uh, take on those supply chains, all those corporations. Florida, you're talking citrus, you're talking strawberries, you're talking tomatoes, you're talking quite a number of uh, crops on there. They all have their, they, they all have a, a systemic design uh, in, in their supply chain. You just got to go to the right uh, body that controls, that's the pivotal decision maker in the setting the prices. And it ain't going to happen unless farm workers are organized in a way that they develop their own organization, develop their own democratically led uh, leaders, and uh, uh, agree collectively what is the next issue that's important that they need to take on. You can't take them on all at the same time. You just got to pick your fights. Uh, this is what I think what Cesar Chavez did uh, very, very well in, in the early years in the 60s. Uh, it carried on and they've, they've uh, enabled much success like Flock has. We've been able to pick our fights and uh, organize the workers and the workers make the claim and the workers make the decisions in a, in a, um, in a democratic collective way. Let me, underscore that. This is very difficult. because I remember the first time uh, when we created, uh, like we were proposing with the tobacco companies, uh, a mechanism for, um, uh, for uh, implement freedom of association, the right to organize, the right to bargain collectively. The first thing we negotiated with Campbell Soup was not a contract with them. The first thing we negotiated was an independent labor board. It was chaired by former Secretary of Labor, John Dunlop. And we had uh, four other uh, commissioners with him that were very high ranking people in agriculture and in the labor movement. Doug Frazier, a former UAW president, was one of the commissioners uh, for us. Monsignor George Higgins, who was the, uh, 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 the United uh, Council of Catholic Bishops voice in, in labor at, at that time, uh, was on that commission. They set the ground rules for representation procedures and collective bargaining that Campbell Soup had to comply with. And um, um, with that, we were able to uh, have our first uh, elections in Ohio. And I remember those first elections, Dr. Dunlop with his crew of Harvard students going out, explaining to the workers what a ballot was, what, what voting was, 
what are we voting for? If I have a union, how do I do that? Well, you cross your X right here. And um, uh, it was quite an experiment. Uh, and since that time, when we, you saw the pictures of our meetings where workers are voting on things, uh, they, they, gotta be, they gotta be trained and brought into how to, how to participate. And we invest a lot of time getting workers to participate and run through ideas into what should be, a, uh, we as the elected leaders, uh, what is it we're going to push and what are the fights are we going to pick? And so um, that is very difficult work. It's very drudgery, time consuming uh, work uh, to get that democratic participation, but it's invaluable and you cannot, you cannot uh, successfully uh, win big fights with Campbell Soups and other manufacturers without it. You, you got to have that collective voice and it's got to be democratic. Uh, you can't go around and be appointing yourself as a leader, as a spokesperson. I limit my comments to uh, issues that the workers have uh, passed in our constitutional conventions through resolutions. And I, that's, that's my, those are my marching orders. And I have to account for those uh, at the next uh, convention is coming up 2021. So I got I got to prepare my report, what I've done, what I've not done. Otherwise, they'll throw me out and get somebody else. So we'll carry out their collective voice. <laughs> so I have um, one, one of our, our guests is, uh, is thanking you and Flock for all of your organizing leadership. And um, the same a person asked a question, was curious about your, um, your thoughts about, uh, you know, how, how do you feel about minimum wage slash guaranteed wages um, for workers, including uh, farm workers. Excuse me, I misread this. Let me uh, clarify. How do you feel about a minimum wage guaranteed wages campaign for workers, including farm workers? And we'll have one more question after that. Well, we've always fought for um, wages not dropping below certain levels. Um, I remember Cesar Chavez, uh, speaking at our first constitutional convention in 1979 in uh, an old Mexican uh, dance hall in Holgate, Ohio. Uh, the hall was packed with strikers, the Campbell Soup strikers. And um, it was our first constitutional convention. And uh, Caesar was asked the question, well, how do you compare uh, what you're asking for in California to what workers are asking here in Ohio with Campbell Soup. <laughs> His answer was, uh, um, well, we're terribly underpaid, but um, um, we ask for what we can get. And, and uh, it's whatever we can get, we're gonna, we're gonna shoot for that. So uh, yes, uh, definitely, if there was a floor minimum wage, like we have the, uh, our federal minimum wage, but that's violated daily. Uh, uh, because of these um, elusive farm labor contractors that I was referring to earlier. And I think that's one of the biggest threats to, to um, uh, workers um, continuing to be marginalized uh, because then they impact the standards of other workers who are in a more uh, legal setting with their employer. Because uh, if this employer is paying less than this other guy next door, uh, it's going to drive the wages down. And so yeah, uh, we can set minimum wages all we want. The, the difference is how do you enforce them? And again, you can't do that without workers organizing to ensure, like any law that's passed. Uh, we're arguing about this um, on another matter. Um, and the people are saying, why don't we legislate this and get this thing done through legislation? I said, well, the legislation is good because it does set a, set a standards. The trick is how are you going to enforce it? And how are you going to implement it? And I tell you one thing, there's no law in this country uh, that has not been uh, implemented successfully without the recipients of that law having been organized to ensure its enforcement. Yeah, thank you. 
I think for our, our final question for you today, although I wish we could keep you for <laughs> longer because we won't, we didn't have time to address all the questions that came up. But one of the questions um, is, I'll read the question first. Um, and it is, what do you think about food as a utility? What would food as a utility look like? you know, similar to water and electricity as a utility? Uh, that's, a, I never thought about that as, as, uh, as a, uh, in that fashion. Um, I think back uh, in my young years, when I was young, and we had very little food in the house, um uh, we hardly had the other utilities you speak of uh i remember our light being cut off one time when we were like two months behind in the bill and um i remember that uh we didn't have uh direct access to water we had an outside pump we had to go out and get and pump water out and um uh yes we want to have uh, a guaranteed a way to have water, to have food uh, in our bellies, to have light in the house at night. Um, and um, uh, again, you know, we can, we can say we can treat food as a utility, as something that's uh, necessary, but even the other utilities that we have are not guaranteed. Um, uh, how do we maneuver ourselves into a position where we have access to these things? I think that's why this study I was um, uh, uh, referring to, quoting from, uh, from the uh, rapporteur for the United Nations, and, uh, and the, the, again, this food security issue, access to food, um, and farm workers uh, ha having that, and any any human being in our country, inner city people, poor people, uh, that's a that's a very fundamental uh, thing for uh, for a human being. Um, and so, uh, if we had it uh, designed as a utility, again, how you design it, who's going to govern it, and who's going to implement it. And uh, unless people uh, can find the ability to determine their own lives, self-determination, uh, through collectivizing their energies and efforts, uh, then maybe we have a, have a chance of eliminating uh, world hunger uh, child labor, eliminate child labor, not just the worst forms of child labor. Uh, a child has to do the things that children need to do. They need to learn by, by playing, by doing the things that children ought to do at their proper age and um, not be forced to grow up any earlier than they have to. And uh, so I think it all, it all has to do with this sustainability issue. And it has to do with eliminating these designed um, uh, design systems that marginalize people. And it boils down to money. It boils down to the prices. It boils down to who's making those decisions and who's profiting from it. Like, because I, I think like, if you do things right, let me tell you, we had a lot of discussions about this, uh, the, the profit margin issue. The farmers who built that, that housing that I was referring to earlier, they came back two years later bragging about how much productivity had increased. The, the Heinz company did a study in the first three years of the collective bargaining agreement with us. And by putting up workers in self-sustained housing, eliminating the common use facilities, they would come home from the field, clean up, wash up, eat, go to bed earlier, get up and do the same thing in the morning, not have to fight over waiting in line at, at the shower, waiting for the uh, water heater to heat up another batch of water so you can take your shower. We had the people were lined up till 11 o'clock at night trying to take their after evening shower to be ready for the next day. And uh, when they did that, uh, I think the Heinz, I still have a copy of that report somewhere that showed that productivity increased like 43% on those Heinz farms uh, that were in the cucumber harvest. And so if you treat people right, help put them in a sustainable way by giving them proper wages and proper working conditions, uh, you'll be rewarded. Uh, those companies were rewarded uh, by the yield and the, I think the, the cucumbers, the, 
the desired cucumber was the number one, the small pickle that you fit hold in the jar. Um, uh, they gave the biggest price for that. The, 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 the yield, the percentage of number ones in a hundred pound mix before the union contract was 18%. Uh, uh, in the three year report that Heinz did, that number uh, went over 43%. So the company got more of what they wanted. The farmers got a, a better price uh, for their cucumbers and the farm workers end up uh, making we had workers make, uh, we had workers earning up to eighteen dollars an hour in the cucumber harvest. Uh, this was back in the eighties. Uh, so, the them putting more money in the supply chain did not hurt their profits. It uh, it helped them. So I would say that uh, this is something that could be a model for uh, other agricultural products, and certainly one for the rest of the globe and our our counterparts in other countries. Thank you. I think that is the best place to stop <laughs> on, a, on a success story, but also on <clears throat> a reminder about the important role that, you know, the obligation that businesses have, um, you know, to exhibit sustainability leadership. And so we thank you very much for your time today, Valdemir. Really appreciate it. I think that not only those who have joined us today, who've stuck with us here through all of the, the Q&A, but those who will be tuning in to the recording will have learned a lot, a lot from you and a lot from your experience. And uh, I know it's always hard to be a voice for others, but we appreciate you sharing your time and sharing the voices of those that are harder to invite to things like this. <laughs> so really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of uh, those who joined us uh, here today and uh, uh, lots to be mindful of as uh, we move forward in, in all of our uh, roles in the food system and a reminder that we have to pay attention to all of the different dimensions, even if it's not our core area in the food system because it's the foundation, right? <laughs> so it's the, you know, our, our labor is our foundation in the food system. So thank you so much for, for joining us. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you all.